I have been studying wristwatches for years. Angles, feelings, complications, but also the behavioral environment around them. And out of my selection of preferred and distilled shapes across time, there are three watches which ended up being my preferred ones. And for this reason I brought in front of you my preferred squared holy trinity, Monaco, Reverso and Santos. Santos de Cartier has 118 years since its birth. The Gégé Le Coutre Reverso has 91 years. And the Hoyer Monaco has 55 years. Together they've summed a quarter of millennium of evolution. So how can we call them if not definitive timeless designs which survived to so many changes in our recent accelerated evolution? With buried dials, plain dials, with enamel or gyosh, these are influential pieces that marked important moments in the history of watchmaking, which still reflects in the current days, becoming more and more included in today's trends, even accepted and respected by enthusiasts which prefer rounded wristwatches. Time is everywhere. Time becomes too unimportant to be carried around on the wrist. The originary must-haves are today optional wearables, but for those who matter, time on the wrist is everything. So we clarified that. The only thing remaining to clarify is how come time becomes squared? Reconnaissance is the ability to distinguish a shape remaining embedded in our memories due to the unnatural contradiction between angles and the spaces remaining unfilled. So why the hands of wristwatches need to leave their perfect orbit to be illustrated with empty spaces around the corners? Scientifically, there is no answer to this. But the joy of seeing hands orbiting in a restrained window as a rectangle is undoubtedly surprising. And of course, with controlled proportions and measurements inherited from the artists of the Renaissance, the rectangular designs have equally rights to stay with classic rounded watches at the same table, in the same market, on the same wrists. The power of line and intersection addresses elegance and order, as we described it in our previous tale. Through the certainty and the clarity of the shape, we establish visually structure and order because these watches are forcing us to adapt to them and not the other way around. They are demanding us to present ourselves in a different way, but in exchange, they will repay us. If I had to describe the racing label, I'd probably imagine colored cars, a checkered flag and a gauge with a needle that tries to reach the limit. If I'm thinking better, I think I'm describing perfectly the Hoyer. Monaco. And I'm not sure if this model was inspired by the same mentioned racing elements, but for sure it was a milestone and an important piece for the Hoyer brand. Once because of the avant-garde design of the Monaco, which was built to amplify and delight many influential people in the 70s. Here mentioning the appearance of the King of Cool, Steve McQueen, Nicky Lauda or Joe Seifert as promoters of the Hoyer brand. The square was also important for Hoyer because alongside Breitling, Dubois de Pra and Hamilton Buren contributed to the creation of the first automatic caliber. The chronomatic group was challenged by Seiko and the Zenith Movado group. And then this Tag Hoya Monaco was recently recreated and reimagined by the brand. We can call it a new era for the Monaco line and a déjà vu. Because this squared chronograph was recreated once with the launch of the in-house Hoyer Caliber 2, exactly as it happened in 1969, once with the launch of the automatic Caliber 11. The historic model was recognizable besides the squared shape through the reverse panda tone, with a blue dial contrasted by two silver subdials, red and metallic accents. Today, the model keeps the same diameter DNA of the iconic one, but becomes thicker and more complex due to the in-house caliber too. The watch is taller now, reaching a 15.5 mm in height. The layout also received a third discrete subdial at 6 o'clock, so an artifice made by the brand to keep the same iconic dial layout, but to fit the metallic seconds hand on the bottom, next to the date. The composition feels busy, but architecturally, the dial elements are very well prioritized to highlight what is important, having as well the corners of the dial which helps the composition to breathe. 
Unlike the Santos de Cartier and the Reverso, the Hoyer Monaco is a racing watch and the least demanding from the dress code perspective. And we can say the watch becomes more formal once with this release because it received a bracelet after an absence of more than 30 years. The Hoyer Caliber 2 is a success despite making the watch to be thicker and heavier. And talking about contradictions, it is very nice to see the rounded window and how it integrates with the square shape, unveiling the beautiful decorated movement. And double successful is the fact that the Monaco finally received its own heart. For so long, this square was equipped with third-party movements like the ETA Valjoux and Salitas with modules. And now it finally feels to be complete. This is the Jugel et Coutre Reverso Duo Face Grande Date GMT. An astonishing piece that features from a superb Yosh pattern with large Arabic numerals, a twin big date, day and night indicator and small seconds. And then when we flip the watch we have the black rounded dial with loomed numerals as a secondary time zone. A third time zone on the bottom left and on the bottom right we have the 1224 hours indicator and an 8 days power reserve indicator. So everything mentioned sits under this capsule which measures 11 millimeters in height. And I guess I said everything about the craftsmanship and the mastery of the brand which was developed in tens of years. When you'll see this watch for the first time you'll simply be shocked as you cannot imagine how they do it, how they manage to make an accurate multi-layered mechanism built to be compressed and connected in that tiny capsule. For the brand it matters, the experience of the wearer when the capsule is reversed. On the dual face models, everything changes once it's reversed. It's like experiencing another world, another watch with different features. The decorations are also changing. We leave the gyosh pattern and the blued classic hands, swapping it to a more modern dial, more easy to understand and more commercial. Design-wise, although the Reverso and the tank are very similar in look, sharing a similar case shape and a similar design dial layout, the brands very few times stepped on each other's territory. The Reverso has its own design language. It's different besides the retractable case, through the trapezoid profile and the horizontal top and the bottom lines which ties up the capsule to the volume. It feels like some tight laces are fixing the case core to the back case. The dial is different as well, Reverso following a different railway track illustrated with Arabic numerals or metallic baguettes on the exterior, where the tank is differentiated through the discrete slim case and on the dial through the railway track with black markers which are surrounded by the iconic Roman numerals, but also through the blue cabochon sapphire which is a permanent signature for the brand. The Reverso concept came on a viable trend as the world needed safeguarding methods to protect their watches. At the beginning of 1900s, the idea of making a protective facet to a watch avoiding damaging crystals during polo matches transformed into a mission for Jacques David Lecoutre III and in 1931 the swiveling capsule concept Reverso was born. And of course, there was competition, the Vacheron Shatter, the Cartier Cabriolet, which transformed later on into the Basculant, or Patek Philippe, which simply bought the rights to have their own Reverso. And it is quite interesting because the reversible concept lasted for so many years, and at some point, besides Cartier Basculant, the brand remained without competitors on this niche. And this is another grail of mine, besides the Santos and Monaco. Not sure if this large model with two faces and pushers will complete my personal rectangles trinity. I'm not sure if I want to go big or simply follow the roots and get to the original mono face with a canvas, which will obviously inspire me to paint it. And as for the third square, I owed you a product description but also a field view of the Santos de Cartier as I already had the chance to wear it in multiple contexts, strapped either on a bracelet or on leather. The Tank and the Santos are probably the most popular Cartier wristwatches. It is a particular excitement to see them all together, to see their iconic dial with Roman numerals and the railway track with the blue hands transposed into different aspect ratios. Or the Rond one. The Santos de Cartier is not perfect, it's not. It is not characterized as the perfect finished watch or the most inclusive one. Has some minor printing faults on the dial, but also the screws are not aligned and people might suffer because of this. 
The truth is the screws being functional, actually holding the bezel and the links between them. It is pretty hard to drill the material in a way so the screws can stay aligned. On the other hand, there are renders on the internet with the Santos having the screws aligned. And it is pretty awkward, unnatural or automated. I think the contradiction between the expectations of the people and the small little faults makes this watch even more interesting. Because you can understand the small gap between craftsmanship and the limited human error capabilities. After all, without magnifiers we are unable to see the tiniest details and without computers we are unable to align a microvolt. So when it comes to human maneuvering, everything becomes arbitrary. So that's a nice feeling. With every version launched by the brand, the design becomes more fluid. The polished bezel slides now covering the top and the bottom until it meets the strap joints. The polished facet indeed can become problematic once it meets other objects in time. So the scratches are in my view the only threat to this watch. I am personally expecting for the future releases other alternatives for the bezel. They are experimenting with the newer PVD releases, but only with the large versions, keeping the 35mm version more faithful to the original concept. But no matter the size, Santos is differentiated through innovative features, like the buttons concept that actions either the adjustment of the bracelet or detaching a strap from the core. And besides the love for the label of Cartier and the historical Santos design, the watch has as well an in-house heart, the caliber 1847MC, which was introduced in 2015 once with the Cartier Clay collection. The movement features a date and a no-date version without a false positioning on the crown, has 2800 VPH and 42 hours power reserve. The movement is exotic, having a self-winding rotor but still fits the case that measures 8.83mm in height, ensuring as well a depth rating of 100 meters. Solid specs which makes it to be, besides the recipes, a sport grab and go. And as a side by side, although these watches are rectangular and elegant in their particular ways are different, they belong to different worlds. The Monaco is and will belong to the motorsport, so a solid chunk of metal built to serve the purpose as a tool and as a statement watch, which will fit from a racing suit to an everyday casual outfit. Due to the robustness and the higher waterproofness, I prefer to call it a safe watch. Where the Reverso is at the other end, more sophisticated, more sober and elegant, which is adapted and perceived to be worn like Bruce Wayne on a tuxedo or on a business casual outfit. The 30 meters watt resistance recommends it to stay in safer environments. Although the original watch was designed to serve as a shockproof cricket watch with a solid reversible case back. The Santos in exchange combines pretty well both worlds. The thin reduced 0029 has the robustness of the Monaco with 100 meters watt resistance being also anti-magnetic. But also the elegance of the Reverso especially on the leather strap. I think the Santos is more playful and more of an everyday watch despite the lack of loom. So call me fanatic, call me absurd, but I think these watches are strong pillars which should be found in any strong watch collection and I will personally chase to have all these pieces next to the rounded ones. And curious I am to know what do you think about the rise of the rectangles? Which one would you consider and why? Please let me know in the comments below. And as usual, if you're new around, please consider subscribing for future episodes. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. And until next time, be brave, Bob. Stay safe.